I am going to talk about um, not all of the Vietnamese art scenes, particularly how censorship um, kind of uh, influenced in a way the way each practitioner kind of worked and operated within the scene, both the um, kind of the downsides and um, also how that kind of creates a sense of um, um, a challenge that artists and sometimes curators really enjoy and how to cope with that. So I will start with um, Sorry, I'm not very good at PowerPoint presentation. Is it not going? No, it's not moving. Oh, yes, okay, it is. So, um, I assume that um, some of you are not familiar with the Vietnamese art scene, so I just, I'm just uh, trying to give you a very brief uh, introduction, um, some contextual background. So, um, the, the f Vietnam was a former French colony, and it's the French who actually introduced the idea of fine art into Vietnam in 1925. So before that, there was no notion of authorship. Everything was done collectively and signed collectively by a craft village. Uh, even a painting would be signed collectively. So um, the French Beaux Arts Academy um, introduced this idea of a single artist creating work. And then um, the Vietnamese uh, art was uh, was following that tradition of what the techniques and the styles of the French teachers <coughs> for a long time, up, up until I would say 1954, when the country was divided into North and South of, uh, Vietnam. And I would uh, I am based in Hanoi, and I was born and grew up in Hanoi, the North of Vietnam. So my experience doesn't limit to, to just. Uh, Hanoi, but also that's where I I think I guess I know best about. So I was just um, for much of what I'm presenting, I'm referring to that. So in the north of Vietnam, after 1954, um, it was dom uh, the art scenes uh, was dominated by a socialist realist um, style, where artists, writers, every art practitioner had to. Um, portray a positive image of the country, of the system, and of whatever that was going on in the country. They had to be patriotic. They couldn't use the dark colors. They couldn't paint miserable farmers, for example. Only the positive side of thing. And this is a, a document that was created, that was uh, issued in 1946. It was um, a... Um, proposal for the direction of Vietnamese cultural and uh, development and basically arts and culture is a battlefront which means that every practitioner <coughs> is a soldier on that front and so arts and culture has been viewed for a long time since 1946 but particularly after 54 in the north as an instrument to the state uh, um, and the communist uh, regime that was taking place, that was uh, taking over um, the north of Vietnam and later the country. And I put this quote by Ho Chi Minh. I don't know when he said that exactly, but I read it in a journal article, and nobody knew. But it's the guy. It acted as the guideline for cultural policy in Vietnam for decades, and even now. Um, and so in 1975, uh, it was the fall of Saigon, which in, uh, you brought the country, the North and the South, back together. And censorship was continued. And what was happening in the North of Vietnam before 1975 uh, was imposed in the South of Vietnam as well, um, which meant that all the kind of abstract uh, um, works that were taking place in the south of Vietnam before 75 and now became in a way prohibited, not encouraged and some of the artists either fled the country or they stayed inside Vietnam and faced with re-education uh, programs and uh, uh, yeah so there was this certain erasure of southern artistic practice in mainstream narrative. So 
in the museum, you wouldn't see displays of works that were created by uh, Southern artists before 1975. At least not one that was uh, more free in their thinking or more critical of the Northern regime. Um, and it went on like that, very strict censorship and every aspect of life, including arts and culture, was tightly controlled until 1986, where the government finally realized that the country couldn't function like this anymore, the economy was collapsing, and so they introduced this open-door policy. It started with economic, and then it moved further into you know, the social aspects. Um, and so we had a slight, after 86, then a slightly more relaxed culture policy where uh, you start, uh, the Vietnamese started to see a flow of international exchange. Um, foreign professionals could enter Vietnam finally with restriction. Um, and likewise with the Vietnamese artists. Uh, but for the first time, artists were allowed to travel um, to different countries. Um, and so um, before, but in the late 80s, things were still pretty rough. As in, it was a, a transitional period. So the government couldn't cope with the changes that were coming from outside. So there was still a certain level of uh, control and surveillance that was going on. But and I think in, in exactly in 1990, the first gallery and private art space was allowed to open. And that's the beginning of a new era for Vietnamese art, where, um, Contemporary art started to be able to present, to be presented in public spaces, and artists could could um, follow their personal inspirations rather than one that was dominated uh, and imposed upon them by the state. So I will uh, go on and kind of uh, introduce to you some aspects of censorship and how that kind of uh, affect the art scenes and the artists. Um, so, first, cultural policy, as I introduced before, art is only a means to communicate government message, and strict censorship is applied even until now. It's a little bit more relaxed, but you still need permission for exhibition, for public gatherings, for screenings, for film festival, etc. The list goes on. And then, in terms of art education, the curriculum in the art school is dated and very conservative. They teach technique, not critical or conceptual thinking. It's not even encouraged inside the art school. And private school is not allowed because they cannot, uh, well, they can still control the curriculum. But if you, you can, you can basically, you can establish a design school, but not art school where you will introduce different critical Frame, uh, thinking frameworks and you introduce different um, periods of uh, internet uh, of the global art uh, history and then in terms of the overall uh, art education the art is only allowed uh, I think in in all the schools in all the public schools uh, art is all is only included in the cu curriculum up until the age uh, up until grade age which is the age of 13 or 14 so after that you have a choice either to abandon art altogether or you move to a completely different direction that is to follow the professional path of becoming an artist and so there's nothing in between there's nothing to provide an uh, alternative uh, kind of uh, programs and something fun to look forward to for the students and art education in the public school literally means drawing, colouring, and copying paintings or, yeah, and there's no art history, uh, no, there's no guide, or well, there's no lessons on how to, on different uh, periods of art development or how to read artwork or how to appreciate and enjoy artwork, etc. And all of that leads to an apathetic audience. The, the general Vietnamese public sadly do not care about art and 
They don't even know that some art forms exist. For example, contemporary art didn't actually attract public's attention until the 2000s. It started to emerge more um, kind of strongly in the mid 90s, it's particularly the late 90s, but uh, still only a small proportion of the population were aware that it existed. Those who already had some affiliation with the artists or with the art scene, or those who are generally interested in um, arts. But other than that, nobody knew. I mean, I had to, I think in the past five years, what I'm trying to do is to explain to my family what I do, and still every time they retell that story to their friends or the neighbors, it's a completely different job. <laughs> it's a different description. Um, so art comes after economic well-being, and artistic career is no longer prestigious. <coughs> it's something, it's widely perceived as something that one only takes up what if one is doing terribly uh, academically. Um, so I remember I wanted to study art when I was growing up, uh, not particularly visual art, but performing art. And I wanted to study piano in the Conservatory of Music and my mom said to me, why do you want to do that if you're doing so well in school? And it's a very common understanding up until this day. And uh, besides that, we have the museums of fine arts who one would expect to provide you know, a, a, a thorough narrative, um, narratives or timeline of art development in Vietnam, but no, the museum is super outdated and in a way irrelevant to public life. I'll show you a quick uh, photo. This is what it looks like inside the Vietnam Museum of Fine Arts and you can see the, uh, the objects, the works are densely hung. There is no caption whatsoever about the artworks the movements or the artists there is nothing so basically if you don't if you didn't study art history you would have no clue what went to uh, the museum and also they have no they have no public program to provide this contextual backgrounds on the works and that happens because uh first of all um it wasn't um very open the system it's particularly the the institutional um, system uh, that belongs to the state is not very open to the idea of curatorial practice. They wouldn't let anyone in, but also because they have limited space and then they just have to try to squeeze everything in. And because the, the staff are paid, I think they're very underpaid, so nobody really cares to like about the museum and nobody really took care of it. And when outsiders or independents like me uh, want to try to help, then there's a, a very a kind of complex network of bureau, uh, bureaucratic paperwork that I have to go through to prove that uh, I know something about art and to prove that um, I'm there to help but not to destroy or present a negative image of the state. And then, so that's the museum and and a very important element that kind of built up the art scene and shaped artistic practice in a certain way is the market. We lack in Vietnam, we lack serious galleries. I think there are only a handful, I can count them on both hands, in, or less than that, it's just one hand, um, in Vietnam. And the market is full of frogs and um, you know, there's even feature on the New York Times about uh, how Vietnamese market was full of sex work. When the country was open in 1986, there was a wave of, uh, of collectors that came into Vietnam and buy Vietnamese art. And the artists and uh, practitioners at the time, they were unfamiliar with how the market functioned. And so they saw that as an opportunity. Everyone was, equal, everyone was equally poor. And everyone was looking for an opportunity to make money to support themselves and their family. So a lot of them was started to reproduce their own works. But also a lot of the art students copied the master's work. And they did it so well <laughs> that for a long time, these 
fakes, uh, those fake works were circulated in the Vietnamese art market, but also in the regional art market. Um, and so it has a, it, and that kind of terrible reputation damaged the market um, ever since not the late 90s. And I don't think it has recovered ever since because it still exists and there's no regulation on how to handle this kind of um, um, unfortunate uh, incident. And then I just wanted to quickly show you an example of an exhibition permit. So for every, this is a permit with an exhibition that I did last year, where you submit this application, you have to do it three weeks in advance, three weeks before the exhibition. And some of you who are familiar with uh, staging an art exhibition, especially for a newly commissioned work, you know how difficult it is to get everything ready three weeks before the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to apply for one and then whenever mm -hmm. something happens or the police comes or um, the cultural um, uh, official comes and they ask you for one, you have to present one, otherwise they have all rights to close your exhibition and you may get a warning for it. Um, yeah, and so, but nevertheless, I think we still have, um, despite all of the difficulties, uh, I think we still have a strong, very small, but strong communities of art, of art practitioners who strive every day to fight against the obstacles and challenges to keep the scene, um, you know, to keep this exciting scene continued. Um, and then I'm gonna talk to, I'm gonna talk about how um, we employ different strategies to go around censorship. Uh, so first, uh, in terms of the space, because the space, all of the spaces are either owned by the government or by people with, with money. And artists don't always have money to rent a space and to run an art space. So a lot of them use their home as uh, the beginning uh, or as a platform to uh, carry out their practices. So in the photos, uh, the photos are of Salon Natasha, which was one of the first uh, art spaces um, in Vietnam. It was taken, well, uh, contemporary and experimental art spaces in Vietnam. And it's based in Hanoi. It's run by artist Wu Zentan and his wife Natasha who is a Russian writer who came to Vietnam and fell in love with his artistic mm -hmm. soul, I guess. Um, and he, Wu Zentan, is, he's the one playing the piano right here. And he's actually one of the few artists who I think felt the urge to employ different mediums in his work. He works with sound, he works with different materials, and he was one who actually started Cre produce or uh, creating installations even before he knew that was such a word. So I think he's one of those artists who had it within himself. He felt the urge to do something more, to to find different ways to uh, a more complex way to ex express his ideas. And so this place became his home. He, he and his wife opened up his living room to host artists, writers everyone who was interested in what they do and they would have and it would be a safe environment for liberal and free conversations to take place and this is another space that's uh, rather well known it's actually like hillary introduced in the beginning it's the space that i started to work um, at when i first returned to vietnam after my studies um, it's called Nyatan Studio initially, now it's called Nyatan Collective because it reflects the, the, um, the, the nature of the space where its function is run and it's uh, maintained by a group of artists and curators. So it was taking place inside the home of artist Nguyen Magnit and uh, with the support of, uh, for programming from curator Chen Leung and uh, it was seen by many as the first public space for contemporary art because with Salon Natasha it wasn't open for, for the public but this one this uh, Nyasan studio is open to the public public could come for the opening for the duration of the exhibition to attend concerts it was a place of where all kind of art forms and art practitioners kind of came together 
and practice because they had no space else. And also, it was again a safe environment for them to kind of uh, explore, exchange, and discuss their artistic idea. On the right hand side, it's a, a photo of an exhibition that took place in Yasan for only three days. The reason I brought it up is because even when art was taken, even though home was seen as a safe place for art to take place, Yasan studio faced uh, um, a, like a, a quite a heavy level of censorship. It was actually forced to close down three times over the course of its existence. It was founded in 1998 and um, it was closed a few times already, um, and the neighbors also acted as a network of surveillance. So every time, so the police would come, the cultural police would come and would uh, give a warning, um, and then the owners, the, the co-founders would say that this is my home. People who come here are my friends. So they're not the public, they're just our friends. And so they could get away with it, but then the police would work with the neighborhood to establish this neighborhood watch where if they see more than 10 people entering the house they would call the cultural police and they would come third after the third time and say no this is enough we're closing you down so uh, 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 um, in the third time of closing down they finally threatened the the owner the house owner and said if you keep doing this we are gonna face we will face with no choice but to withdraw your business license and you may be removed from your home and so everyone decided to stop and find it. We would find a new space. We didn't want to um, to create any trouble for the owners, who is also the co-founder in any way. And one of the artists, right before closing down, she installed this exhibition where she, it's a video installation um, uh, about, and she, she filmed different, she filmed the, communi uh, the communities of artists in Hanoi standing up and each of them will eat something of their choice and they would uh, narrate what they, who, who they are and what they've just eaten. And this is her sign of protest because in many cultures, including the Vietnamese culture, nobody stands while they eat. It's only if you're treated very badly or if you're interrogated, then you do that. So it's pretty clear what, and then she tries, she, she did it just three days before it officially closed down as a sign of protest, showing to the officials that, you know what, we get your message, but we all will never stop. So I think that's a, a nice way to close uh, this chapter of Nya Sam's video. Well, I mean, later we moved from place to place, you know, we did um, kind of pop up mobile art projects, and now we finally have another space. And we're more smart with what we do, so we apply for permissions, and then those kind of um, programs that we see that would that could potentially bring us into trouble, which is not to do it in our official space. We would do it in a cafe, on the street, somewhere else. And then the next would be the street, because I mean um, exhibition permission. If you so this is an exhibition of an art project called the in the Into the Air, you have to where initiated by an art mission. In, um, so this is an in, exhibition in, in of an art project called uh, Into the Air, space. Air where and initiated uh, by an art space. They did, in, um, this is a public art project in, where um, uh, Manzi worked space. with 10 artists and, um, to they develop This is a public art project where and they would install um, that in different public spaces in Vietnam to develop different artworks to apply for permission. That and also, that is one of the way to trigger what they would actually have with the public to apply if your ignition in a way where it's like a treasure one of the way to you may actually encourage more people, people to public participate in it. But also, because it's taking place in, in different places in the city, so even those who are not interested in it, but not also know this project because it's taking place, they can still see the work, they can still see. see. So even those who are not interested in it, they do not know this project out more about. They can still see the work, they can still see the work about the Vietnamese art scene. Very interestingly enough, one of the works that we have about the uh, if it's taking place in, in public spaces, then 
Now, the one of the work local authority cannot I mean, confiscate uh, if the work, they in, can just tell you to remove spaces, it. Then so this the work, uh, local authority cannot, cannot confiscate the work, they can just tell you to remove it. So this work, uh, tank, uh, tank uh, and the wheel will actually attached um, with a sculpture of a military facing tank directions and the uh, wheel thing at the chaotic and placed with um, a sculpture of turtle uh, facing different directions of the political uh, hinting at the chaotic that um, uh, uh, that uh, is still uh, happening in Vietnam at the moment particularly uh, as a consequence of a bunch of um, uh, the series of uh, unsustainable development projects that took place earlier and it was placed in right in a corner of this one of the main kind of uh, streets in the center of Hanoi and after three days uh, the police called the organizer and said look you can't put your work here because you are violating public space and so they didn't want to stop it the organizer the curator actually contacted the Swedish embassy and asked if they could move this work into the garden and they okayed with it and the Swedish embas uh, embassy the garden actually faced the street so it's within diplomatic territory so the authority couldn't do anything about it but everyone could see it and the, the project went on, uh, lasted for a month I think it was a very smart way to kind of um, reach the target audience without having to deal with um, permissions and uh, yeah and then yeah sometimes performances take place uh, I'm using this example of an artist called Wing Tae Sun his work in English translation would be people carrying people carrying people <laughs> and so this vehicle this tricycle thing is a co it's commonly used by and can only be used by um, <coughs> disabled war veteran uh, because it's the way for, uh, of the Vietnamese government to compensate for their sacrifices uh, instead of giving them, them a job or equip them with skills that could allow them to be employable they decided to do this so they can sell things on the street and um, so the artists created this uh, printed this and mounted the photographs onto this foam kind of card cardboard and then cut them out and then put them on top of the vehicle and just drive around the city for days and uh, again it's it's a way for the for the public to see when they're stuck in traffic they can see this and then sometimes they would actually sometimes they ask the driver like what is this what are you doing what are you selling and then being stuck in traffic the artist disguised as the driver will tell them about you know his ideas and and uh, this is art and a lot of people were confused <laughs> but um, it I think it was successful in a way that it triggered this curiosity in the public and uh, hopefully it will turn into something else and like I mentioned before diplomatic venues was also uh, used utilized as um, a, spa a, a space for um, arts so the this um, is a screenshot a still from a still image from a uh, very renowned artist in Vietnam called Chen Leung um, it was first exhibited in Vietnam actually this was featured in the Guggenheim No Country show in New York a few years back but it was first exhibition in Vietnam in, nine, uh, in 2013 uh, at the Goethe Institute but after just a few days the Goethe director got a phone call from the local police saying that we would appreciate it very much if you take down this exhibition and so after a few warnings the director actually closed the exhibition but then we had always wanted to show this because this is um, you can tell, you know, this red scarf is very mm -hmm. symbolic for many people who uh, who have grown up in a communist or a former communist country. It's, every, it's something that every student has to wear to school every single day. It's red, it's the colour representing revolution, representing the blood that was shed to 
to realize the revolution and to bring freedom to uh, the Vietnamese people and not just Vietnamese, I'm sure. And so the act of just presenting this image, it doesn't matter if you are gonna, if the artist present, uh, presents a good image about it, it's just not allowed in the artwork. Um, and, um, and so, um, Chang Lu very uh, cheeky, I think he, um, in 2015, when he received the Prince Paul's Award for his achievement in uh, promoting and developing the contemporary art scene in Vietnam, he contacted the Youth Commission because they wanted to present his award there in Hanoi and said, can I present this work? Because he knew that a bunch of official Vietnamese officials would be attending the event. And then so him and I together, we did it there and then it, it showed a pretty strong message. Um, of the artists and the officials cannot say anything about it because if an event is taking place within a diplomatic venue then basically that venue, that space, that premise is owned by that country's government, not the Vietnamese so they cannot interfere. So it's a good way to do that and sometimes we, we uh, every year some embassies have their garden party and we would try to contact them beforehand and sneak something in um, and then we actually get a good, um, sometimes we got uh, even collaboration and support from people who came to the event and knew that we were doing this and then they supported that we do and they continue their support afterwards. And of course, you know, in the age of uh, digital advancement, everyone uh, use um, internet as a platform. And I would give you a very this project is an online moving image exhibition or film festival. It's called Embedded South, where the project explores um, the notion of the global South as understood by artists and practitioners, filmmakers who come from that region. <coughs> and it, it didn't include just artwork from Vietnam, from Cambodia, from Malaysia, from etc. And uh, the reason for this project to take place was because Sanat, the initiator of, of the project, after years, after a decade of, uh, of promoting and driving the Vietnamese art scene in the South, in Saigon to be particular, it finally was forced to reduce their operation to just an office and a reading room. They could no longer hold public program. They could no longer deliver exhibition that would be seen to the, would be shared with the public. So the director then, Zoe, but a very amazing curator, thought, you know what? Why don't we do this <coughs> online? We could still carry out our exhibition, but on an online platform. So we asked um, people who were interested to register for it, and then on the day we would screen it, but all the information of the artist and the work and a synopsis of the work will be uh, is still stored online so you can later on trace back. And uh, um, I think that was really nice because even though the us, the co-curators, specified that this would not be screened offline, but a lot of people actually in different parts, they knew about this program and they presented in a cafe in their home. So a bunch of people getting together and see it. So I think it was a very um, clever way. Um, and then another aspect that I want to briefly talk about is archiving. Um, we all know the importance of archive, particularly in under the conditions of censorship. Archive is the only way to pre preserve information that was heavily censored and suppressed. Um, for example, this is a, a project that I co-curated last year at the Taipei Biennale. Um, it's an pr uh, archive presentation of this group, of this movement of arts and literature called Nhân Văn Zai Phẩm, which is, an, which is the name, the combined name of two journals and magazines, Nhân Văn, which means humanism, and Zai Phẩm, which means beautiful works. And this movement took place in, uh, emerged in the mid-50s in Vietnam, and they face severe and brutal um, suppression. Artists were put in jail for that, and they were sent to re-education camp. None of their work were published, nobody would employ them. Many of them died 
being alcoholic because they just wanted to find a way to escape their reality and many of them uh, just kind of survived, but just mainly survived. And uh, we wanted to, and working on this project, we wanted to um, collect first, you know, the, all the magazine, all the issues of the magazine and journals that existed and then digitalize them and then collected kind of um, their um, well, materials from their families that would present their thought process, their works and their lives. Um, because this movement had a huge influence on the Vietnamese contemporary experimental art scene in music, in visual arts, in literature. And they, the suppression of them created a fractured in Vietnamese art development. Everyone is influenced by them, but like their legacy and their works are not are never properly, thoroughly discussed and presented in the public. So, uh, I mean, I, my major growing up in Vietnam, in, I went to school in Vietnam and my, I went to one of the specialized schools and my major was literature. And I, this, the name of this book or any of the artists in it was never mentioned. Um, I only knew about it when I went away and started to um, to be more adventurous in terms of uh, looking at the past. Um, so working, excavating all these archives, myself and my um, colleagues also hope that, you know, even now it's not properly discussed, but if we don't collect the materials one day, all the artists are going to die. And even if you wanted to look at what they did in the past, it's impos it would have been impossible. So what we are trying to do is to collect as much material as we can so the future generation may be in a more open and liberal time, they can look back and they can bring that to into public eyes. And finally, um, another kind of partly archival project that I am working on is this Gang of Five project. It's also an exhibition that I uh, am curating and it will take place in October in Hanoi in Vietnam. What is so special about this group and the reason why I wanted to work on creating an exhibition for them is because they emerged in the late 80s in the time when Vietnam entered that transitional period where it wasn't like for the first time painting from personal point of view were allowed. So you see, this is a painting kind of poor children. Children Before 86, this, these kind of themes would never be allowed um, um, by the, um, the, 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 the local, the, the government, because it would present a rather negative image of the country. Why are they poor children? We are communists, you know. Everyone is supposed to receive free education and enough food to survive. But for the first time, artists could portray what they saw. Um, and then they could start with uh, painting more abstract uh, and uh, more abstract works. And that was like the foundation for um, the development of contemporary art and the use of different materials and different ways, methods of, ex uh, of uh, expression in Vietnam. Um, but this group, like I said, this group emerged in the late 80s and the early 90s where it, there was still a strong level of censorship that took place because, I mean, the country had been open, but the culture, uh, the, the Ministry of Culture wasn't sure what, how they would handle it. And so they still quite kind of kept the a close, wa uh, uh, close watch on these guys and they were also among the first artists who in a way introduced Vietnamese art, particularly northern Vietnamese art, to an international um, audience through participating in exhibitions in Hong Kong, in Tokyo and selling their works to private collectors and also to collections and museums in the region. Um, but at the same time, for the younger generation, we all know that, we all know the name of all the artists. We all know that this group is important. But we never knew why they're important, why they're so special, why we need to know about them, what their artworks were like. 
Because, you know, these images I got from the collectors, I got from working on the exhibition, they're not readily available. I mean, you can't just Google them up and things will show. They will show, but very limited, and not the early works anyway. So I wanted to work on this to kind of open up this, um, open up this, kind of, in a way, a, a debate about this work, their role in society, because now they've moved on into different directions. One of them became a pioneering figure for, the, uh, for contemporary art. One of them remained, uh, two of them remained uh, very commercially successful. And then one of them went into publishing, who dedicated his career to uh, introduce uh, um, art books to the Vietnamese public. So uh, in a way, opening up their practices to the public, <coughs> allowed them to see what happened in the past, their works, and also as a result, um, pulling together um, a volume of their body of works that later, if anyone want, was, um, anyone is interested, they can just, they don't have to go through the trouble that I had to go through in the past two years to find the images and the information about the group. And the exhibition is going to take place, just on a side note, it's going to take place in a film studio that was uh, built in the mid 50s in Vietnam to shoot propaganda movies because the setting is just beautiful and I think it, were, it ties very well into the con the conditions and the context when these guys graduated from uh, the, the art school and uh, it reflected the con con conditions um, of their early career. And finally, uh, Another strategy is partnering. I mean, the reason why I use this photo is it's taken place in one of the artist studio. It gathered uh, artists and curators from the north, the central part, and the south of Vietnam. And basically, that's how the Vietnamese art scene uh, can still survive and thrive because we have a strong network of friend, friends. We did. All of us um, part. Uh, get together, because we know that without each other, we can never get anywhere. And it's a crucial survival strategy, really. So you get help and support from artists. So if a project cannot be realized in one place, you move it to the next city. Or at one time, you can all do one thing together at once. Um, and I think we, because we, we lack funding, there's no funding from the government, funding from foreign sources is limited and it's getting fewer and fewer and we face a strong set, um, pressure of censorship and we don't have a large audience base so if we don't get together I don't think there's any way that it could work um, so I just want to quickly summarize my presentation uh, I have introduced you some of the projects that I've worked on and how practitioners in Vietnam kind of navigate the scenes and function within it and find way to um, to counter the restriction the restrictions that I impose upon them. So not having money or a, a space for contemporary art actually allow it to be flexible with the space. We can do it in the street, we can do it in our home, in a hospital as one of the projects that my friends did. Um, and the film studio now, so we can choose a space that best complement the concept of the exhibition, but also a space that will actively uh, and, di um, and well, directly, actively um, intervene public life. So if the audience is not coming to us, we have to find a space and a way to, to, to show them that we exist. And also, in a way, it's the natural, oh, I don't know why this changed, but it's a natural filter of art <coughs> practitioner because there's no money, there's no social status, no recognition. So those who actually, especially those who um, su uh, survived the scene throughout the 90s and the 2000s, they stay doing what they do it's because I think they're generally passionate about what they do because otherwise, it's very difficult to just survive. Many of the artists drop their practices, or they moved on and do and and took up different jobs. There's completely nothing to do with um, arts. And then I don't know why the the writing is a bit funny, but I'll just talk through.
scarce funding actually does not affect the art scene that much because we're so used to not having funding <laughs> and because um, we usually even when we get funding it's only enough to for insula insulation of the work I mean I've never worked on a project where I get curatorial fee um, I actually also have different jobs to support my um, curatorial works um, so people, are, everyone is so used to it that they just apply funding to realize their project um, and bring their project to the public. Many of them invest their own money from different sources of income to create their works. And later on, if they are lucky or if their works get known, then they get, and then the works will be bought by the museum or will be exhibition. They'll get a fee from it. That's how they make back their money. They make their money back. But it doesn't always happen. So I think that actually the lack of funding actually allows artists to be more true to what they want to do because they will not get funding anyway. They might as well do something that they are passionate <laughs> about, they love, and mean something to them. And also, there are many possibilities for public programs. You can do it anyway, and there are different audience groups, then you come up with things to uh, kind of uh, um, interact with them. And all of this allowed artists and everyone to think about the relevance of their work to the immediate community and to the society in a larger sense. Because if you have to go through so much trouble, if you have no money, if you work your, um, if, you, if you kill yourself creating an artwork, and then you have to deal with the, the, the pressure from the government afterwards. Uh, and then family pressure as well, everything. <coughs> then you may as well make it worthwhile, you know. And so all in all, I think this censorship, it creates, definitely it is an obstacle, but in a way it allows um, room for creative strategies um, to find ways to actually reach the public and very interestingly enough I think it gives practitioners um, a, a, a challenge, a sense of urgency, like they have to do it, but it's some, a sort of inspiration and that's how we still survive and a lot of artists still fight every day, not so much anymore thank god but still do um, to continue making work and somehow it's, it's still growing and uh, I think a part of that is attributed to the level of restriction that, it, that are placed upon them then they try even harder to do it, I feel, this is my observation and that concludes my presentation so thank you for listening and, uh, yeah and then uh, I know. So I think I will get to her question first before we get to the public, right? Great, yes. <laughs> so I do have a few things that I want to ask. It's been such an incredible pleasure to be in dialogue with you for many months now. But I know a lot of secrets, so I didn't make it into your presentation. So I'm going to try to ask you about this. Um, I like this thing that you said, um, learning to become more adventurous um, and looking at the past. Yeah. Uh, and I'm kind of... Uh, also interested in revealing the fact that you explain your formation as a curator as being trained by artists as opposed to having any kind of formal education and artistry in curating. So I'm kind of wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of how you came to your practice. Yes, um, so um, you already briefly introduced that I, how I became a curator without having a, a background in um, visual arts or curatorial studies. I started working, uh, long story short, I started working as a fundraiser and then when I moved back to Vietnam after working as a fundraiser in London, I volunteered to work for Nyasan Collective and there I started, in, uh, aside from maintaining the space and running the operation, I also worked with the artists, the collective to create, to deliver artistic program, annual programs. And I did it for three years, and 
the artist came to me and said, you are kind of doing what is expected of a curator. Are you interested in becoming one? And then, uh, on another note, I was working as an assistant curator to another curator and was mentored by a few curators in the region uh, on uh, being a, 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 assisting them in their projects. And they said, I think you may do a good job. There are few, very few curators in Vietnam or in Southeast Asia anyway. Why don't you become one? <laughs> and then I talked to some of my artist friends and they said, I think you could do it. You should just try. Um, and so I just, that's how it all started. And then I, t I, I was not very confident not having a background in visual art. So I applied for a training program that was initiated by the Japan Foundation for young uh, curators in Southeast Asia. And I was mentored by two amazing curators. One is a Tokyo-based curator, and one is a very uh, great and critical artist curator based in Jakarta, Indonesia, Ade Damawen. And um, and my yeah, so that's how I was actually encouraged by um, the the artists and everyone around me to 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 try and become a curator. And when you said uh, you briefly mentioned that how I was actually trained by uh, curators who are artists, yes, both Ade and Chen Leung, my two mentors, they are artists. They are more. They 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 work as a curator now simultaneously as being an artist, but they do have a very strong when um, approach as an artist to a certain project. So I I learned from them, and that's how shaped it shaped my practice. Usually, so there are certain things that I notice that they always put forward. So of course, you know, everyone starts with the concept, with the idea. But then they, in the process of working with them, I realized that it's the the visual element is always placed first, and uh, and. And they said, this is one thing they said to me, if you put three, two or three artwork together, I can always find a narrative that somehow tie them. Mm -hmm. um, but if they have completely clashing visual kind of outlook, then they'll make your exhibition look terrible, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that's one of the things I can't, I, I, and I think I shouldn't just kind of uh, try, uh, generalize, you know different approaches here but that's just one of the example and that and learning how to install the work like the basic rule of lighting of um, from the very basic stuff that I didn't get to learn uh, like color combinations you know the golden rules in art of compositions and everything else to, to how to hang an artwork um, everything I learned from the job and I learned from uh, the artists so I think in a way it, 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 it shaped the way I work. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about how you work, I'm always struck by the sense of really um, deep kind of strategic thinking that you have to do in ways to kind of move around some of the hurdles that you described, but also this sort of like boundless feeling of being energized by your limitations. Yeah. And that's maybe something I associate with artists more than curators. Yeah. Um, so I'm also wondering if there's something about you know learning in that way that you think has kind of made you well suited um, to having these different kinds of like very creative strategies for what you do. I think there are two. I would say there are two kind of uh, factors that kind of uh, fight into what you just uh, described. Um, working with artists. Uh, in developing and in helping me come up with these creative strategies. Um, yeah, it's true in a way because um, they give me so much inspiration, first of all, that uh, sometimes, you know, the, 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 the struggles of the everyday life and the dealing with um, anyone else, <laughs> um, from funders to the audience to the local authority, it's very uh, exhausting, but working with them and seeing how much dedicated they are, it gives me, you know, I don't know if it's strange, but it actually is, in a way, it's like a drug. Seeing them working so hard <coughs> and giving themselves, I feel like 
oh, this is nothing. You know? And I was actually working on some of the archival projects. Mm -hmm. I realized that artists had it so much worse in the past. But somehow they still kept making work. And that, that kind of energy and spirit um, um, I can relate to. And I was very inspired by that. So that's one factor. Another factor for this ability to, in a way, uh, an ability to, to develop creative strategy. I think it may have to do something to do with my background, because I studied political science. So, in a way, I understand how the system works and how I can get around it. <coughs> I could understand the rule in order to break it, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the two. I mean, some of your stories about, in fact, the way you think about interacting with the cultural police and the ways you think about those relationships mm -hmm. were really interesting to hear. Um, to me, of course, like the whole idea that you would have to present things in this way or get a permit are so outside of my own experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought you had some very interesting ways of like thinking about power relationships. Um, and that, you know, that, that kind of, at this point, that that form of control is really just one that's an exercise of power yeah. in various ways. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the strategies that you use in those interpersonal ways, or yeah. how you think about those deeper questions of what motivates that form of censorship. censorship. Yeah. yeah, censorship is, it's an ex like you said, is an exercise of power. It's the way to, in a way to, um, cover up the kind of uh, alternative narratives that would um, that wouldn't help in the process of consolidating uh, power of uh, the communist government's power um, it was true in the 40s and 50s and it's still true now because now that Vietnam is more open you know, there's the internet people are going outside you know <coughs> you don't monitor them very well and something may happen <laughs> um, so being aware of that, but I, I am also aware that many of the officials that I encountered, they were just doing a job, because otherwise they would face uh, consequences, punishment, losing their job. So, and that is very important, because if you can understand that, then you know that they're just trying your job. They're not unreasonable. So you can sometimes you can still talk to them. One of the strategies is to talk to them to let them know that this is what I'm doing. There's nothing bad about it. And somehow I, I tweak the words in a way that it wouldn't present a, a bad um, narrative. Um, but uh, you talk, I, talk, I would talk to them and I would apply for permission. One of the things that was different since I came back was bef the, with Nya San Collective, before I came back, they never applied for exhibition permission. And so they were seen as being very suspicious. Mm -hmm. But when I started to do that, then the authority, the local authority started to realize that, oh, these are just a bunch of people, you know, doing what they want to do. And uh, yeah, and they, I mean, they still monitor what the artworks are about, but also they are more relaxed because they, people only fear the unknown, but they know what we, who we are and what we do. So in a way, they are less concerned about us. And then another thing is that because the it's still it's, it's still a bureaucratic system, you know, everywhere bureaucracy is bureaucracy, and there's certain things that they need to tick off the box. But if you know the right people, and then you can, especially there's a there's a I would say there's a significant level of corruption in Vietnam, um, unfortunately, but that's how we get things done as well. So in a way, I use that to my advantage. I mean, I don't bribe them because I have no money to bribe them. But uh, I would uh, create events and things I would invite them to to make them feel that they are special. And then so they're like, okay, I'll keep my one eyes closed sometimes. And then sometimes I have, uh, well, I've, I have uh, established relations with some of the officials that now they would call me and warn me beforehand. Said, I know you're doing this. Don't deny. Um, somebody is watching over you, so just be careful. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, that's how you kind of uh, play with the power structure, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Another thing that's been really interesting to hear you talk about is um, this kind of real desire to think about how to cultivate the art and the audience for contemporary art, that it doesn't exactly exist. Um, and so you also, you know, in addition to some of these other challenges, have to really think through those questions. And I think that you also have come up with a lot of interesting sort of strategies for how to do that, this kind of like more guerrilla tactic of showing up at exhibitions and kind of mediating and talking about the work in your own kind of unofficial way instead of how the institution itself might describe what the work is. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that side of your practice. Yeah, so um, for most of the exhibitions that I, well, actually all of the exhibitions that I have um, contributed in, um, there's, I always run um, curatorial tour and I ask my partners to do that too because at first that's the kind of gateway into understanding the exhibition and the work. Because I mean, if the public is not is not exposed to seeing such uh, objects, um, they don't know how to start with it, and then they will start to feel intimidated by it, and they might not come back. So that's the way to, and then that's how you, the curator, and sometimes the artist get to know more about the audience. Uh, that so that's one thing I guess. That's one aspect of it. And another, in the past a few months before coming to New York, I also realized that I showed you the photo of the museum. I mean, it's ancient museology, it's really bad. <laughs> and people walk in having no clue what it's about. Oh. They can't even enjoy the work because they have seen some other works in the world and they don't see how significant that work was when it was created. And they're like, you know what? It's not that good. And so you, you need a certain uh, kind of point of entry to allow people to understand Vietnamese art history and the purposes. So I started to do this uh, museum walk where I just posted on different forums online on Facebook that I said, I want to do this free guided tour of the Museum of Fine Art at this time. If you're interested, join me. It's free. And so that's my way. That's another way of. Um, because I can't get into the school and offer the tour because I'm not a teacher. You need a certificate in order to teach uh, students and in Vietnam anyway. Uh, and you have to go through the school system, the board and you know parents involved as well. So it's difficult and you can't just walk up to a random adult and tell them, look, I'm doing this tour, please come. So I started with posting information on the arts and cultural platforms online and then that's how I try to expand my audience because people don't tend, not most people don't tend to come back for the same tour every week. Every week I'll have different people and I would just, at the end I would give them a list of the art spaces and the activities and of the website that they can check for information about arts and culture. So that's my uh, attempt, another attempt. And then uh, the last project that I worked on was an interdisciplinary project where um, me and my team worked really hard on bringing um, some of the exhibitions to the more official space, one of which being the Museum of Vietnamese Women in Hanoi. And then we try very hard to bring our series of lectures into the universities. I mean, it didn't work out very well because out of, let's say, uh, 35 institutions that we contacted, we only, we only managed to secure three, no, two collaborations. But still, it's a, it's a small step forward. Um, and we just have to keep trying. Uh, so that's another way, I guess. So those are the three main things. If you do an exhibition, you try to let the public understand what you do. And then the other part, just trying to seek them out, I guess. Yeah. Um, having now spent uh, many months in New York and absorbing oh. a lot while you're here, <laughs> I am very curious how you think that um, your time here might influence your practice or change the way that you think about the work that you do when you go back? Um, 
first of all, I don't think it changed the way I look at my work and the way I view artistic practice. Um, but it allowed me to um, be exposed to different kind of arts and I, I guess also get inspiration from some artists or performances or ex uh, exhibitions that I saw, some initiatives that I saw. And um, it, I think it helped uh, me in terms of rethinking and crystallizing my curatorial practice, like what I want to do. How, kind of ident it helped me to identify what other key things that I want to work on for the future. So I think it's really helpful in that sense. And just getting the inspiration. And sometimes it sounds a bit silly and cheesy, but sometimes it's just good to know that there are other people who appreciate what I do and what um, what artists in Vietnam do, and that just helps and keep going. I guess because of, yeah. Um, I have just one more question, and then I'd like to really open it up so that the audience can ask some things. But I guess you know, living here in a very strange cultural moment, and um, you know, having spent most of my professional life working as a curator um, in New York, uh, I'm really for the first time starting to feel this question of like what it might look like to lose one's artistic freedom um, or to be sort of threatened um, by 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 some of the dynamics that I think that you're dealing with in a very different level for different reasons over a long time. But you know, what advice would you give to those of us who are kind of scared from the other side of this equation at this moment? I think the most, uh, I wouldn't say advice, but I think it's just a thought that I share is that it sometimes it's not as bad as it is if you actually understand the, the, the bigger picture. You can connect all the dots and you see, so this is an area where there's a lot of restriction. This part has less, so you just move from you know, one place to another. So it's most of the time it's not as terrible. I mean, it's bad, but it's not as terrible <laughs> as it seems. <laughs> and I mean, we are art practitioners, so I think, and I do have this strong belief that everyone is going to find a way to counter that kind of restriction. And, and we can come up with different way, different strategies, depending on the context that we are in. So I think it's, I mean, it will be probably be more difficult, but I think uh, desperate times come desperate measures. You will always find something that uh, to, to keep doing what you're doing. And like I said, it's not always as terrible as it is. Because then maybe you will feel um, more charged to um, continue your work. I guess so. <laughs> well, thank you for the good advice. Well, thank you for the questions. I think it it, it helped our audience to kind of understand maybe the, the Vietnamese art scenes and my practice a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add another note that um, it's I, I I'm as much as I'm based in Vietnam, but I also started to work more across Southeast Asia and East Asia, and I do see a pattern of Titan. Um, control of the arts and culture and maybe that doesn't just limit to uh, East Asia but I do see that and um, and uh, a lot of what I presented to you today um, the strategies or the energy and the sneakiness that we do it's shared quite widely across the region so yeah and I and that's why I was very confident in saying that there will always be a way. Mm -hmm. Because I've seen that in so many places. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Does anyone want to ask a question? And finding possibilities for collaboration with staff there, just welcoming to um, work with contemporary artists or curating. Yeah. So uh, that space, that museum is very unique because they actually rented out their top floor to this uh, um, art uh, organization. And like I met, briefly mentioned before, in um, uh, 
there's a level of corruption in Vietnam, which means that if you know the right people, you can get things done. And the owner of that art organization uh, who rent the space at the Women's Museum, she's quite well connected and her family is quite powerful. That's how she got the space. But nevertheless, it's good because we have an, another space for contemporary art. And taking place in the museum, um, I mean, it's an institution, so it legitimizes in a way the kind of objects that are presented and the kind of works that are exhibited inside its space. And so when people go there, they don't, I, I guess I, I guess some of them may still be confused, but they don't feel like this is weird and why are we looking at it? Because it's a museum, you know? It's gotta mean something. But sometimes you see, well, sometimes I did exhibitions in the Vanden space. I mean, I created, I, I produced one exhibition in a student housing accommodation. And all the students are like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, and then try to explain to them that still the, the idea was very foreign. Um, and then they, they were a bit suspicious. They weren't sure if I was one of those, you know, mad people or I actually meant what I said. So um, even though the space is run by, um, if the space is run by this gallery, but still it, it helps in terms of introducing the public to uh, to contemporary arts. I think it's still something to be appreciated. Yeah. I guess your response or solution, yeah. or I don't know, proposal. Um, so I, I was really, um, drawn to the painting that you showed earlier called Poor, Poor Children. Children and I want to speak to the culture of image making because I feel like should I go back to that? Let's go yeah. back to that. Um, I feel like so you also talked about the the conservative qualities of the art schools there. And um, they're they're extraordinarily yeah. conservative and I guess to those who aren't familiar with the Vietnamese Academy yeah. to graduate in painting, for example you need to make a painting with a minimum of three figures. Yeah. You know, like that's how strict it is. And yeah. if you fail to depict three bodies, you wouldn't get a diploma, right? Yeah. So I kind of want to like think about this painting and also like that parameter, and then also lump in there. I feel like there's a lot of young Vietnamese artists who regard contemporary art as a foreign enterprise. Yeah. And so those who are not intimidated and have the confidence to get into some of these spaces, despite them being Vietnamese run or whatever, there's still a confidence to approaching things that are new, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of um, abandon their uh, love for image making that I still think brings true. Yeah. Um, and then tries or attempts to create works that appear as contemporary, but are more like Exper like sort of experiments or juxtapositions that kind of mimic what contemporary art should look mm -hmm. like. And I guess my question going back to the idea of censorship is, I feel like there's like a giant group of Vietnamese artists who are not mobilized because they work in mediums that are deemed obsolete, such mm -hmm. as oil painting or yeah. drawing, but they themselves as Vietnamese artists are very political, yeah. right? And, and then are not equipped with say, English, right? Yeah. Or living in a city or something like that. I don't know, what are, what are your thoughts on that? So I will try to break it down yeah. in different parts. So first of all, you are right. The Vietnamese art scene is very, well, I, I wouldn't say very, but it is polarized. Uh, it's divided into uh, the artists who are associated with uh, all the commercial or even souvenir galleries or association of fine art, which, um, I mean, they're just, for me, I feel like it's not much to look at because they're all creating the same thing that would be easy on the eyes, you know? And then there are others who are against that and they work across mediums and um, so that's one thing. That's that's one, I guess, uh, part of what you were, what you just addressed. Another part is that I disagree with you in the way that 
I don't think, at least any of the artists I've worked with, even if they work with other mediums, I don't think they ever abandon painting or image making. Mm. Uh, maybe it's just not in the work that they present to curate and to the public, but in the studio, that's where uh, that's where I always see something, a sketch, a drawing, paintings, and somehow they always come back to painting, which was what they were trained in. Mm. Um, but I think I kind of understand what you were getting at in terms of how some artists, uh, I would say like a small portion uh, of artists who kind of try to mimic what contemporary art should look like without presenting a, a really like an authentic, um, presenting their authentic idea and, and whether, you know, without having come from the real, the actual urge to try something else. Um, there is, and I don't know how I should, and I, I guess one of the reasons is because, oh, this is my set speculation, I'm not sure if it's true, but one of the reasons is that contemporary art now is getting more popular overseas, so people know that if you are doing that, you'll get the attention from outside of the country, in a way, mm. and you may be able to seek funding. Another reason is that uh, they just, I think some of them are generally stuck with what they were doing, which could be lack of painting or sculpture or whatever that they are doing. So those are my speculations about why some artists create works in that manner. Did I miss out any part? Sorry, I feel like I missed out something. No, just like, you know, like how, how do you work through, yeah, sensor, you know, like how do you work through this obstacle when you don't have possess the confidence to enter these contemporary art spaces when you're only equipped with the conventions of your own art education yeah, yeah, and yeah, you okay. yourself though are just a living breathing political person yeah, right yeah, yeah. i mean that i feel like there's like tension there yeah then, let's say you are, can you are equipped to make those lacquer boxes you yeah, know what i mean yeah, and yeah, yeah. are a political a very politicized yeah. agent right so i think uh we, uh, I, I would say that those artists, oh, we still get along with each other because the art scene is so yeah. small. Even though you don't agree with each other's practice, you can still get along in harmony mm -hmm. as long as the topic of art making is not brought up. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes uh, uh, artists um, work with um, craftsmen as well and, and with experts who study thoroughly the, um, the craftsmanship that they learn in school as well. Um, but there is, I was, yeah, it is difficult because there's still this invisible yeah. fence that keeps those who think that they don't make contemporary artwork mm -hmm. from yeah. those who do and uh, there's a tension and some, uh, the power relation is also very strange because at one point, you know, all the people who study um, kind of um, traditional techniques received a lot of funding from the government. They were viewed as the, the, the gods of Vietnamese culture. Whereas now, the, the tie has turned a little bit. And so these contemporary artists look at, uh, you know, people like, you know, you are an interesting person, <laughs> but I don't appreciate your art that much because I mean, you are a craftsman, you may not be a true artist. I mean, that's not what people are saying, but I mean, I'm just generalizing things here. So there is a tension and it's difficult for me as a curator to, to, to work, you know, in that um, entanglement of relations. Um, but I think I don't choose to work with artists based on the mediums that they present. I just work with an artist where I like their work, or uh, the, the, the topic that they are interested in um, kind of resonates with mine. I also worked with some of the, I mean, even working on this Gang of Five exhibition, because they're painters. Well, that's why I was so drawn. I've yeah. never seen any, like, I've never seen anything like this. Yeah, they are painters, yeah. and uh, they were active in the late 80s, and <coughs> I would say no young curator would want to work with them for various <laughs> reasons, but one being 
they just are not they they just don't know these guys well enough for me i uh, I am a little bit different in a way because I work with Chen Lun, one of the artists in the in the group, but also because my father were friends with two of the them in the group. So I actually grew up with sketches of their work since I'm not having known, you know, who these artists are and what those sketches are about. Um, so that's my type. But also for me, I I am generally interested in the project and working with them because of the the archival aspects that I mentioned in my presentation because I do think that like them or not, like their works or not, they were there in the history. And you need to, you know, I feel you need to, 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 to document that or to keep it alive. And so what if, and then later on when, because imagine 20 years from now, I could create my own curriculum about uh, Vietnamese heart history to teach at the university. What if I don't have the material that I need? So I just try to think a step ahead. Yeah, and and most many I've had in the past two years I've had artists, curated art and curators ask me, why are you working on this project? What interests you? I mean, they were okay, but now they're not doing anything new anymore. So what's so exciting about that. I think my excitement lies within, you know, the other reasons. Not, <coughs> not entirely put the works that will be presented in the exhibition um, 100%. I, I grew up in a sort of a heavy duty censorship in Czechoslovakia. And what I see as a great loss is precisely the lack of documentation that for the young generation, yeah. there is no way to learn about many artists who might be very good, but you cannot access the, the material anymore. Yeah. So my basic question is, with the limited funding, could you do a good documentation, for example, of your exhibition of the Gang of Five? Would that be in print? Would that be on, obviously online? Or how would things really yeah. work? Because it's an incredible resource, yeah. and you know, maybe not 20 years from now, but maybe five, yeah. maybe maybe right now, you know. So. Yeah. So um, uh, for we draw funding from different sources, and <coughs> like you said, for example, with the Gang of Five exhibition, actually we had some funding to print the catalog, and that will be, I think, I, that will be part of the uh, materials for later. And but for other projects, then we uh, sometimes I got funding or got permission from other institutions overseas. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I think I kind of volunteered myself to do it. Mm -hmm. And many and some of my colleagues did that too, because you can't wait for funding forever. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may take you years to get decent funding for your project. If you don't act fast, some of these materials are going to disappear. Sure. And exactly. people disappear too. Yeah. And I think it's important to yeah. documentation, like we talk to as many people and do archiving the interviews and things like yes. that. So I am lucky in a way that I have some colleagues who are very understanding and supportive of what I do mm -hmm. and they help me sometimes. Or sometimes they initiated the project and I just loved it and I just volunteer myself to work. But I do understand that, I mean, I don't get money for any project that I do anyway. <laughs> so what's, what, what's the trouble of getting one, a more, a more, a, another unpaid project, you know? And then it could mean something later, even if it doesn't. It means something for me. So I think it's just true. Yeah. It also means a lot, I think, for people who come later. You know? Yeah, and some of it, like back to your, um, particular question, some of it will be in print, which we often uh, send to different mm -hmm. places, like the Asia Archive, or some <coughs> of the archives in the region, are, you know, just curators, and so they can spread the word. Yeah. Some are stored online, like the online uh, um, film festival that I co-curated, mm -hmm. and a large part of the material I keep in my hard drive, not because I don't want to share with people, but because I don't have the resources to share with people, and it's not completed yet. Mm -hmm. But if somebody is ever interested and in asking me about it, I will share with them. Yeah. 
So, and then, I mean, I will pass that on to whoever that comes next and is interested, then it's just, I hope it will be passed on that way. And that's how we keep the memories alive. All right, I think in the interest of time, we're going to have to wrap it up there. Okay. Bob, maybe you can ask Gwen later. Oh, Sorry, we're already way over time. Sorry. Um, I want to thank again to Gwen and to Laurel. Thank you both so much for this wonderful presentation. And I hope this conversation continues and you share more of your archive in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.